So next we have um, Bruno Olshausen, who uh, is a professor uh, of neuroscience and optometry at uh, UC Berkeley, and who's also the director of the Redwood Center for Theoretical Neuroscience. So um, Bruno received his PhD from Caltech and then went on to uh, do some really uh, famous work in which he developed the sparse coding model of visual uh, cortex, which actually links between uh, statistical uh, properties of natural scenes and the response properties of the visual cortex or visual neurons. And uh, Bruno's uh, research interests uh, aim to understand the information processing strategies uh, that are employed for the uh, by the brain for doing things like object recognition or scene processing. And uh, his work is really interesting uh, for our workshop because not only it is about understanding how the brain works, but it's also about understanding how we can build uh, better algorithms for scene analysis using what we learn from the brain. Uh, so with that being said, please uh, join me in uh, welcoming uh, Bruno. Thanks, Leila. All right, uh, uh, good to see everybody. Uh, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, and uh, so I guess what I'd like to turn to here is thinking about common sense reasoning uh, further back in the evolutionary chain, uh, and uh, particularly in, in jumping spiders, which I'll tell you some more about. And then, uh, and then uh, tell you about some work we're doing on trying to understand the neural computations that underlie our ability to do, to do geometric reasoning. And this is work with students Ho Yun Shao, uh, Yubei Chen, and Frank Chi. So, uh, so I guess the, one of the main points I'd, try to, I'd like to try to make here is that um, a lot of our, what we call common sense, uh, really derives from our ancestors, not just mammalian ancestors, but many, many other animals in the animal kingdom, uh, their need to survive in uh, a changing physical environment. So the, world, the real world is always throwing new things at you, new situations at you. And so this is just, it's not gonna be sufficient enough just to sim learn simple rules in order to survive and uh, deal with these kinds of worlds. You really need some kind of general purpose of reasoning. You develop the ability to uh, develop internal models of the world that allow you to, to reason about novel situations. Uh, one form of this, uh, of, this, of this reasoning is geometric reasoning. Uh, and this is what allows animals to navigate, to orient, and to plan routes to, to forage or to capture prey. So I'll give you some examples of this in, in jumping spiders. And then, and then finally, you know, the interesting question is, you know, from a neural point of view, um, how, how are these kinds of computations implemented uh, in brains? And so, uh, and so what I'm going to argue is with the right mathematical primitives uh, that we can design efficient ways, efficient ways of uh, computing these uh, geometric transformations in neural circuits. Uh, okay, so, so let's just start off uh, with jumping spiders. Uh, and uh, so what makes jumping spiders fascinating and, and how, how they differ from other spiders uh, is that they, uh, they do not rely upon a web to extend their sensory space. They, they rely entirely on their visual system to find prey and to detect, uh, detect prey and, and find where they are and to, uh, and to, um, and to, and to hunt them. And so, uh, and so what you can see here on the left is shown uh, just a cross section of their head. Uh, and and uh, so what distinguishes the jumping spider is this is highly developed visual system. They have eight eyes or four pairs of eyes, uh, which you can see here. Uh, two of the two of the most two of these two at the front, the anteromedian eyes, uh, point forward and have relatively a narrow field of view but very high resolution. And their retina is at the back of these long tubes. And as you can see here that retina is basically a one-dimensional strip of photoreceptors. And they scan that back and forth inside the head to build up an image of what's going on in, in the world. So this is the, these are very high resolution eyes. They have on the order of about 10 minutes, 10 minutes of arc uh, resolution, about the same as a cat. Okay, but they have, they have kind of tunnel, tunnel vision. And so to see the other parts of the visual field, they use these other eyes. And these other eyes on the side of their head combine, give them a full 360 degree field of view. They have low resolution, but they can detect where things are in the world. So the way they typically employ the visual system is to use these low resolution eyes to find something interesting moving, and then they orient their head towards it to image it with these high, resolu high resolution eyes to see what it is. As you mentioned, you mentioned they, um, beyond detecting prey, they can also use these high resolution eyes to recognize conspecifics, and they have a very elaborate mating courtship behavior where the, uh, the females uh, recognize these dances that are done by the males, 
and that's, that's an important part of their courtship behavior, which, which they do with these very high resolution eyes. Okay, so, uh, so, so uh, this, and this is just showing some of their typical behavior here. This is just uh, on the right here is a movie of, of a one day old jumping spider. And when they're very young, like this, then that the exoskeleton is translucent. So you can actually see through it. You can see these tubes, which are shown over here on the left. You see these tubes moving back and forth. So what they're doing is they're taking this one dimensional strip of a retina, scanning it back and forth to sort of, sort of analyze what's out there in the world. This is a kind of very typical behavior you see of them is they're always looking around, uh, kind of and checking out the world visually uh, like this. They have all the uh, behaviors of a predator. Okay, so they do this uh, uh, tracking, orating behavior, they, they stalk their prey, and so forth, which you'll see in some of these other, um, some of these other, other movies. Uh, so one of the prototypical behaviors is this, um, are these orienting maneuvers, where as I mentioned, if, if, a, if an object is presented in, in, the, in the field of view of these low resolution eyes, then they quickly reorient the body and the head towards it so they can scan it with these, with these high resolution eyes. And this is just showing, showing some of the data from behavioral studies that these, that these orienting turns are you know, very precisely match uh, the, the orientation, uh, the location of objects in the world. So they're, they're pretty accurate. Okay, so I'll just show this again some more, some more movies, uh, just like their informal uh, behavior here. Uh, so here's a jumping spider. Again, it's a one day old spider uh, tracking a, 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 fruit, a fruit fly, Drosophila. Okay, so this is kind of typical of what you'd see. Uh, so they, they're just locking onto it. And you can see these eyes inside the head are fixated on, on that object and tracking it uh, uh, very closely. Uh, and then this is just showing a sequence where it's actually going to uh, capture the, uh, the fly. Uh, and you can see some of these stalking maneuvers where they sort of creep up on it and they try to estimate how far away it is. Again, this is the first time the spider has ever done this in his life. So it's not quite right um, all the time initially. It makes a few messes, but eventually you see um, it uh, gets it. Okay, so I think one of the things I wanna kind of uh, hope you see here is there's a lot of problem solving here, distance estimation, um, having to deal with novel situations uh, and uh, you know, it's sort of a non-trivial way to sort of plan actions and figure out what to do um, in, this, in this situation. Uh, and these animals are very successful at it, right, right from birth. Uh, so, um, so here, so finally, finally gets it. So this is what vision is all about, by the way, right? Uh, is the ability to, to, to do this. Um, okay, so they, so they have this marvelous visual system which allows them to do this. And so, uh, another one of the really interesting behaviors are, uh, are, that you see in the wild when they make these reorienting turns is they'll orient in the correct direction even when the object that they're trying to pursue is not in view. So this, these were experiments done by David Hill at Cornell in the, in the late 70s. So here is just a, showing a sequence where the spider sees this fly on a lure here. Uh, and, uh, but it can't get there directly by jumping at it. So it has to take a detour down the stem and goes back up. And, uh, and then actually in this case, he removes the lure after initially sees it. So it's no longer there. So it can't be sort of tracking it with its other part of its visual system. And then it, it occasionally makes these reorienting turns in order to like to sort of check out where it is. And what he noticed is that they, they always tend to reorient in the correct direction, okay? Updating where the, their, the spider's new location in, in the space. So to study this more carefully in the, in the laboratory, he built this arena where the spider is, and this starts out in the center here, and it can move back and forth along this track. And it's presented a prey item here out at initially at some position, uh, here in this case, a position two. Uh, and then as soon as it sees it, uh, it's, it's removed from, from view. And now it has to go try to, to get it. And so it has to walk along this track to a new position to get closer to it. Uh, and then when it gets to another location on the track, it makes this reorienting turn towards the object in order to sort of check where it is. And then what he looks at is the angle of that reorienting turn uh, and compares it to what, you know, what it actually should be. So this is on the, on the horizontal axis here is plotted the actual angle that it, you know, the correct angle to, to two here that it should be uh, against what it actually does. And, it, and you can see here it's doing, it's doing a pretty good job of turning in the correct direction. So it implies it almost that they're doing some kind of trigonometry in their head, that they can update, uh, uh, you know, keep track of how, how far they've gone uh, to update where um, in, the, in, in, their own, in their own mind where, uh, where this object now is in the world. Um, and an even more stunning and maybe surprising set of experiments were done by Tarsitano and Jackson uh, on, on another a particular jumping spider called Portia. And, uh, and they looked at this ability to solve these three-dimensional mazes. So basically what they do is they place the jumping spider at the top of this pedestal, and it can see a prey item in one of these two different trays. Okay, in this tray or this tray. 
uh, and they um, and they look what it does. And so what's what's interesting about this is first first of all that the, the, those trays are too far away for the spider to jump directly at it, uh, and so it has to it has to sort of initially walk to it. Uh, and so what they notice is that the first thing the spider does when it presented with this with this scene is that it doesn't just immediately try to crawl towards the object. It sort of stops and visually inspects the scene. It sort of moves its head back and forth and, and scans the scene with, with its eyes and then makes a movement down the pedestal and towards the prey item. And this is just showing where it goes. So if you, if you put the prey item uh, in this tray here, uh, uh, route A, then uh, what they're showing here is that most of the time, okay, when it comes down the pool, it's not simply doing some kind of random searching to find, to find the right pool. It goes to the correct pool. It goes to the base of this pool here and climbs up to get it. If you put it in prey B, then it actually climbs over here. And again, this is away from, away from the object, actually. It's moving to the opposite side where, the, where it sees the item uh, to, to, um, to go to the right um, pole. Okay, so you can even do that when, when the, when the, pole, when the uh, pole is planted in back of the pedestal. So again, it starts here, kind of scans its environment, crawls down the pole, goes, goes away from the prey item, uh, and then to climb up uh, to this wire to get it and, and, and route A. So again, that's, it doesn't do that all the time, but most of the time. The vast majority of the time is going to the right, going to the right uh, base location here on the pool. Okay, so, uh, so this, all, all these experiments seem to point, to point to the idea that with these very advanced, highly elaborate visual systems, these very high resolution, and very, you know, by the way, I have to, you know, testament to how the system is designed. It's a beautiful optical system, uh, and, and, and one of the reasons why you have these long tubes here to get high resolution is because in order to get high resolution, you need a long focal length. Okay, so uh, the system had to sort of push a lot of matter out of the way inside the head to create the space to have these high resolution eyes. Okay, so it sort of physically, mechanically went to a lot of work in order to keep, to design these visual systems to make it this particular way. Okay, so these eyes are highly advanced. At the same time, what these behavioral experiments seem to suggest is that it's using this very rich, very rich visual information to build internal models of its, of its environment and doing some kind of three-dimensional reasoning about the world in these novel situations in order to be able to find, uh, find objects. Okay, so that's, that's the jumping spider. Uh, very quickly mention a kind of related idea, in, 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 uh, again, you, uh, this is sort of a, a system you find in many animals now are these head direction cells. And so the question here is how, how does an animal know where it's heading in, in three-dimensional space? And so in the 1980s, uh, they found these cells in rats that uh, seem to be tuned to head, head direction. So in other words, the direction the animal is heading. So each neuron seems to be tuned to a different direction of space in which the animal is heading. And a model that's been developed for the system is a so-called ring attractor model. And the idea is that these neurons are connected together in a recurrent neural network in a ring topology. Uh, and then the activity across this population, so black means it's a high activity, gray means lower activity, and white means no activity. The activity across this population indicates which direction uh, the animal is heading in, much like an internal compass. Okay, and so, so this is a model that's been well developed. There's a lot of empirical support for it. And so the idea is that these neurons, these 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 neurons inside the uh, rat's brain that represent heading direction, they don't directly correspond to any one sensory modality. They're getting input from many different modalities, from vision, from the vestibular system, from from auditory system, and so forth, somatosensory, from the whisking system presumably, uh, and, and then they use these different sensor modalities to update this representation. So for example, if the vestibular signal sends a signal that, vestibular system sends a signal that is turning right, uh, then it momentarily modulates these connections in the ring attractor, and so the bump of activity across this population shifts to the right. And then when you're no longer turning right, it will simply hold that pattern of activity as the new heading direction. And if another neuron says you're turning to the left, then it will turn back to the left, and again, once that goes off, it will hold that, hold that activity pattern. So, so these have been studied a lot in rats, and, and, and so a really a stunning set of experiments about five years ago in Vivek Jayaraman's lab at the Geneva Farm um, showed that, these, that the flies actually, the fruit flies, Drosophila, actually have uh, these head direction cells as well. And even more surprisingly, they reside in this body, in this nucleus within the fly's brain called the ellipsoid body. So believe it or not, it's actually a set of neurons in the nucleus that are connected together in a ring. So anatomically, they're all connected together into a ring. You can see that very clearly in the anatomy. And these, uh, these, these neurons are now thought to uh, be connected together in a ring, a ring uh, attractor network, a ring attractor network, just like people have developed for the rat. The kind of stunning thing about that, when people developed this model for the, for the rat, they didn't actually think that you know, there's physically a ring in the rat's brain, but they were just simply connected this way. 
And so this sort of stunning thing here is that um, in, in the fly's brain, they actually really are a ring. And you can see that here in this animation as the fly is turning on this trackball, uh, then with calcium imaging, they can see the activity of these neurons in the ring uh, change and move around uh, with the, with, as, as the fly changes direction in space, okay? So I think what all this is pointing to is, you know, not just our mammalian ancestors or reptilian ancestors, ancestors but even our insect and spider ancestors are forming uh, internal representations of the world. They're not simply reacting to stimuli directly with the motor system. They're taking the sensory information, forming internal representations, which are unlike any one of these sensory modalities to form an abstract representation of where you are heading in the world. And it's using these, these internal representations uh, internally built representations to, to guide actions. Okay, so, so, um, so that's a little bit about, you know, maybe I'm going to call maybe common sense reasoning from the worlds of uh, uh, spiders, especially, and, and maybe flies, and, you know, who knows, bee, I'm sure we could come up with similar examples in bees uh, that, exhi that, that exhibit their ability to, to geometrically reason about their environment. So, so, so the next question is, well, how is all this done? What's the neural machinery? What kind of neural computations allow us to do uh, these kinds of geometric uh, manipulations. And, uh, and, so, um, and so maybe we can sort of pose this very simply here with this example of, uh, of a square. Uh, and uh, when you see that uh, same square in a different pose, a different scale and different orientation, uh, you know it's the same object. Well, how is it that you know this thing is the same as that thing? Well, we understand that those are related to a transformation, okay? And in fact, if I were going to show you these as a sequence, you know, this is a frame one and this frame two, you would actually experience that transformation as apparent motion. Uh, so, so this is really sort of, again, a fundamental part of how we see the world about how we relate things to each other is through these transformations. Uh, now, people have, people have wondered about this for a long time. How is it we do these, we do these transformations? Um, there's a long and storied history and probably the first piece of work along these lines was by uh, Walter Pitts and Warren McCullough. This is the same Pitts and McCullough who developed the McCullough-Pitts model of neurons, uh, which was the sort of predecessor to the perceptron uh, model. And, uh, and so uh, th their model is ba ba basically shown here. So they wondered the question is, how do you recognize a square as, a square as being a square, even though it's a different position or size and orientation in, in the visual field? Or how is it that you recognize a chord uh, as being a particular, like an, a, a major chord irrespective of where it is in the musical scale. So this diagram here is showing their circuit for how you recognize invariance in audition. So for example, a chord, uh, but the same idea would be in vision. Like if you're trying to recognize some pattern translated in the image. And the idea here is that the pattern is conveyed by these wires here going up, these wires that are going up here. Uh, so that would be representing sort of like that, in, th in this case, a tonotopic representation of an auditory pattern, or this could be a visual pattern here proceeding from left to right. And the information about this pattern is sent forward into this, to this sort of crossbar network. And at each row here, uh, one of these, these neurons are making one-to-one -one connections with the neurons in each row. With the, but except the idea here is that it, as you go up each level, that those connections that, are, that it's making are simply shifted to the right. Okay, so this is just taking the pattern representing on, represented on these wires and delivering it to these neurons here, one-to-one, -one, but simply shifted to the right by one. And in this row, shifted to the right by two to the right by three and so forth. And then the idea is that these neurons over here make multiplicative gating connections with, uh, with each of these neurons in each row so that it would select out uh, a particular transformation. So if, it, if this neuron is activated, then it would basically take uh, the pattern represented on these, on these units coming in and then shift it to the right by one, two, three, four, okay? So when you turn on this neuron here, it takes the pattern and shifts it to the right by four. So it's basically a kind of neural shifter circuit they proposed for uh, computing these transformations. And they proposed a similar kind of idea for doing uh, scaling transformations in the visual cortex, similarly using this, these, this gating idea to represent these different transformations of visual input and for, um, and for rotations. Okay, so, um, so that's a very early idea. And I'm gonna tell you now about some other wild and crazy ideas kind of along these lines. Uh, but before I do, I want to dis disabuse you of the notion that, uh, that the brain works anything like this, okay? So one of the reasons why uh, Walter Pitts was able to come up with this model, but I'll just back up a slide, you know, the reason why Walter Pitts was able to come up with this model is because he wasn't polluted with the idea of the perceptron yet, okay? It had not yet been invented. 
And actually, the, there's a kind of interesting side story about Walter Pitts. He was a very colorful character. He was widely recognized as a genius at the time. Uh, people like uh, 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 John von Neumann and uh, 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 Norbert Wiener uh, very much uh, were inspired by him and, and, and you know, sought him out uh, as a source of inspiration. And, uh, and he was on the verge of, uh, he was working on, first on his PhD thesis on a, uh, a model of three-dimensional computation in the brain and unfortunately burned his PhD thesis. Uh, so we'll never know about that. But he was, he was definitely ahead of his time, uh, coming up with lots of interesting uh, and create, creative ideas for difficult, difficult computational problems that, you know, that the brain has to solve. Okay, so, so I'm going to tell you some uh, ideas along these lines. And so the, I think the reason why I mentioned this is because it seems to me like our field is kind of trapped in this particular kind of model or framework of thinking about things now and the kind of neural computations we do. They're all sort of this flavor of perceptron units and then stack perceptrons. And, and when I ask people like, why are you, you, why are you doing that? And, and oftentimes the answer will be because, well, that's kind of how neurons work and maybe we're sort of loosening it loosely modeling it after uh, brains, but I just want to make sure everybody knows this is, has nothing to do with how brains work. <laughs> okay, so it's like it was uh, uh, Frank Rosenblatt's initial idea in the 19, late 1950s. He came up with this and it's a time when nobody knew how brains work. Uh, and it's been a very useful kind of computational abstraction. We've been able to use it for all kinds of things. But uh, now as neuroscience has progressed over 50, 60 years, uh, we've learned a lot about how neurons actually work, and we see that they're, they, they're capable of doing much, much richer computational things than this. Uh, and so, so just to give you a couple of, ex of examples, uh, and I think one of the main points here is that, you know, neurons, they, they compute with their, uh, the geometry of their dendrites, uh, and there the ge their dendrites are arranged in very particular ways in order to achieve certain computational goals, okay? And, and in most places you look in the brain, you see very specific kinds of circuits designed to do specific kinds of computations, okay? It's not like you just have one generic perceptron thing that's happening everywhere and you kind of just adjust the weights and then it does something magically different, okay? So you see kind of these, 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 these circuits that you see in the brain that seem to be well thought out <laughs> by someone uh, to, to do particular kinds of things. And so one example is the starburst amacrine cell in the retina. Uh, these have a very interesting kind of starburst shape and the reason why is because they're, they're using their dendrites to compute motion. So they use basically traveling waves along these dendrites. As a, as a bar is moving across the visual field, then that creates a traveling wave in this particular direction. And then these neurons release GABA onto retinal ganglion cells in order to inhibit them for that direction of motion so that they're more selective in the other direction of motion, actually. Okay? But it's the morphology, the geometry of these neurons that allows them to collect motion. They're using compute motion, and they're using more of a traveling wave idea um, to, to do that. This is another example from the barn owl, where these, uh, these neurons that are uh, used to compute sound, the local location of a sound in space, uh, they, they, they compare the timing differences between the left and the right ears. And basically, there, there was this model proposed quite a long time ago called the Jeffress model, where the idea is that you take information from the left, left ear and information from the right ear, and then delay them by different amounts, and you have these comparator neurons sitting at different, uh, different points comparing time delays between the left and right ears. And the way you would create these delays is simply by the, by the propagation, a propagation delay, you know, the, the time it takes uh, an axon potential to tra travel down an axon. Okay, so this is, since this is a longer wire that it has to go down, then it's going to be more delayed here than here. Okay, and then you see this exact same circuit basically laid out in, in the nucleus laminaris of the barn owl, where it's using these delay lines for, um, to take information from one ear, uh, and with a different set of one set of delays and information from the other ear. And then they have these comparator circuits, which are comparing those signals between the left and right ears to compute um, interoral time differences. Okay, so these are just two particular examples. Uh, and uh, and, and, and I, I'd like to steer you to this book here, this wonderful book that came out recently by uh, Peter Sterling and Simon Laughlin on principles of neural design, where they get go into many such many other such examples of how neurons have been very, very carefully designed to, 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 do, to, do, uh, to do certain things. And I think the same idea, I would, I would claim it, it holds for the cortex as well, okay, that we can, that, that we can see similar kinds of structured uh, computations going on there, okay. Uh, so it's not just sort of like you do this and repeat it um, ad nauseum and then a miracle happens. Uh, okay, uh, so, so I wanted to sort of, I'll well, mention that as a, uh, and, uh, wait, and, uh, one more example, which is the most important of all, which is that, um, is that these neurons, uh, you know, why do I say they're not just computing a weighted sum like a, like a, like a, uh, like a perceptron model? Okay, so this is just a showing you a, a, 
a filled neuron, a pyramidal cell. This is a soma. These are all as dendrites. And one of the things we know now about how these neurons actually collect signals on their dendritic, dendritic tree is they do it compartmentally. So in other words, each, each of these dendritic branches has maybe several compartments along it so that inputs that combine together within one compartment will combine much differently than between different departments, say an, a, a, an input coming in over there versus an input coming over here. So it's not just taking away the sum of its inputs. And so that what we know is that within a compartment, these inputs tend to combine more multiplicatively. Okay, so that one neuron can actually veto another or it can amplify another's inputs or gate, gate another's, uh, another neuron's input when they combine on the same compartment, but not when they combine within different uh, branches uh, of the dendritic tree. Okay? So rather than being just a weighted sum of inputs, uh, you know, a better model of a neuron is that it's, it's maybe something more like a sigma pi unit where it's, where it's taking a weighted sum of nonlinear combinations on this dendritic tree. So it's a much richer computational structure. Any given neuron within the brain, a pyramidal cell, is a much richer computational uh, structure than, than a simple perceptual model. Okay, so the reason why I'm, uh, I, I want to mention this is because we can actually use this, this richer computational structure to do more interesting things. Uh, and so, and so one, one, uh, one, one example of that is this class of bilinear models which people have used for computing transformations, geometric transformations. So the first example of which I would, uh, is this Pitts and McCullough model that I mentioned back in 1947. Jeff Hinton has proposed over the years uh, many, many sort of different instantiations that, as this idea, where you use one set of neurons to multiplicatively gate the connections between uh, a set of features and a, another set of units in an object-centered reference frame. Um, this was part of my own PhD thesis, inspired actually by both of these people uh, in developing a dynamic routing model of attention. Uh, uh, Josh Tenenbaum, uh, Bill Freeman, uh, their model for uh, separating style and content. David Arthorn's map seeking circuits, which use this wonderful principle of superposition to, 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 to search through the space of all possible transformations. Um, again, are sort of built this way. There's work from Raj Rao's lab, and again from, from Jeff Hinton and, and with these higher order Boltzmann machines. But the flavor of all these, all these models is shown here. Basically, the idea is you're going to take the image data. So I sub I would be simply like the i pixel in the image. Okay, and you're going to represent that uh, as a multi multiplicative combination of two sets of latent variables. One which represents something about the pose or style of the object there on the scene, and another set of units which represents something about the shape. And so that's something that all these all these models share in common. Okay, and so now it, so and then you have this sort of three-way uh, weight or tensor uh, term which which tells you how much the kth uh, kth unit here uh, for the pose or style modulates the ith jth synapse between, between unit aj and, and unit i in the input. Okay. So when we just uh, sort of think about the sum over k here, then all of this collapses into, basically we can think of it as a, as a weight that's dynamically modifiable by these, let's call them control neurons, c, that control the pose or the style uh, of this transformation. Okay. So, so this is maybe, now you're back to sort of like a simple linear generative model between some latent variables a and the image data, but now we can change the transformation dynamically through these other units C. Okay, so if we want to shift the object to the left or rotate it or do some other kind of geometric transformation, we can use, do that by changing these units uh, by appropriately designing these, these weights gamma ijk to implement these different transformations. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, that's one idea that's, I think, uh, been, uh, been around, been sort of floated and been exercised in a, in a variety of different realms. And I think there's very promising um, work coming out there. Uh, but one of the disadvantages, I think, of this, of this way of doing things is that you need a different uh, neuron C, CK, for each and every transformation and for each and every incremental transformation. So for example, if you want to rotate by 10 degrees, that would be one of these C sub Ks. And if you want to rotate by 15 degrees, well, then now you would need a different C sub K for that, OK? So different neurons would represent different amounts of rotation or different amounts of transmission, translation or different amounts of um, scaling and so forth. So you need one neuron for each and every um, uh, tran tran transformation like that. Uh, and it would be nice to have something that more clearly, uh, more explicitly represents the actual geometric transformation. So more with this idea of equivariance, where a neuron would change its activity up and down as the neuron, let's say, uh, as, the, as the image uh, translates left and right. OK, and this we get with this idea of Lie groups for modeling um, transformation. So Lie groups is basically the mathematics for, for, for describing transformations. And uh, I won't try to recapitulate all the ideas here, 
But, but, but it basically what it boils down to is that in many cases, you can describe these transformations in terms of it very elegantly and compactly in terms of a matrix exponential. Okay, so that's simply, simply shown here. If we have some reference object here, so I naught would be our image of some template or reference, a reference, reference object. Uh, then we can transform it into a new representation, um, a translated, uh, let's say, or rotated uh, image of the object by simply multiplying by this matrix exponential. <clears throat> and so this very simple equation actually hides a lot of complexity because e to the at, t is just a scalar, a is a matrix, okay? e to the at is not simply uh, each of the elements of that matrix exponentiated, <laughs> okay? So it's actually, it actually it changes this matrix in a very non-trivial and very complicated and very hard to compute way, actually, okay? But it very, forms a very nice, elegant mathematical compact description of what we want to do. Okay, so if we design this matrix A to be the spatial derivative of this image, then as, as, as you change T, then the object here will translate, okay? If we design A to be the rotational derivative of this, of, of the image in the image plane, uh, then as we change T, the image will rotate and so forth. Okay, so you can design this matrix A in different ways to implement different transformations. So we simply, simply take this one scalar value T and move it up and down, uh, then, uh, then, the, then the image will uh, change, uh, transform in, um, in, interesting, um, in interesting ways. Okay, so, so, so again, this, has been, this idea has been explored by a, number of, uh, by a number of different labs, by Raj Rao's lab, by my own lab about 10 years ago. We did a lot of work in this area. And then more recently by, uh, by, um, uh, by Taco Cohen and Max Welling. And so I'm gonna tell you about some more recent work we've been doing, which is kind of inspired by, by, what, by, by, their, by their recent progress in this um, area. And I, I just, I think it's worth mentioning that uh, an interesting tie between these Lie group transformation models and the bilinear models that I just told you, as you can see, if you, for small values of t, you can approximate that as just one, the identity matrix plus a times t. And now you can see the relationship to a bilinear model. But basically, this variable t is multiplying these variables here. So you could take this i naught and represent it by another set of latent variables. And then you get, you're back to this sort of bilinear form um, in the generative model, okay? Okay, so, so the example we, we pursued here based on the Taco Cohen and, and Max Walling work, and again, this is just, here we, here we are back to MNIST, okay? We, we started with jumping spiders, and we're now here in the simple MNIST world. But again, just think of this as a kind of a, a very toy basic problem that sort of tries to get this at the essence of what a system would need to do to do uh, geometric reason. And of course, one would need to build on this to make it much, to deal with much more complicated uh, types of imagery. Okay, but the, so the, what we train it on here is this rotated MNIST task, because these are just simply MNIST digits, and each, each digit is a particular style. It's not all the different styles of MNIST. There's one particular five, one particular six, one particular eight, but rotated in all different, all different orientations. Okay, so we're just going to give you a training set of all these different, all these different digits uh, rotated, by, rotated by different amounts. And the problem uh, the system has to figure out is, well, what's going on? Okay, so what's going on here is actually very simple. We have 10 different digits uh, that are being rotated. Okay, so the, so the generative model we're gonna propose for doing that is the combination of a sparse coding model. So we have these latent variables alpha, which are sparse code, and a dictionary five uh, of 10 different elements. And so we'd want, what we want phi to do is converge to, to learn about these 10 different digits that are present in this world. And this transformation T should learn about the idea of rotation and S is a single scalar variable which, which will tell us how much rotation. Okay, we're gonna represent this in terms of this Lie algebra uh, in, in terms of a matrix exponential. Okay, so that we're just gonna simply take the sparse code, uh, sparse code of what we think is there and then, uh, and then transform it uh, with this matrix exponential to describe what's in the, what's in the image. Okay, so, so the details of that, um, I mean, you, you can uh, read Taco Cohen's paper uh, to, to get more of, of it, but basically, to, to do the learning and the inference in this, we, we take this matrix A and uh, actually do an SVD decomposition that allows us then to confine, uh, we, we can ba basically confine the, the matrix exponential to the diagonalized part of that matrix. So if it's a skew symmetric matrix, which it is in this case, then we can decompose the di diagonal term is actually sort of a block diagonal with these sort of two by two elements, block diagonal, okay? And when we exponentiate this matrix sigma, then it just basically gives us these, these, these two by two sines and cosines uh, by, dip, uh, by different amounts, but all controlled by a single variable S, okay? So that's this, that's this form down here, okay? So this is the model we're actually, actually learning. So the things we wanna learn here basically are phi, our dictionary of different shapes, 
And W, which is going to, uh, to uh, do a transformation which enables us to, to transform the um, image appropriately with a single parameter S. Okay. Um, okay, so then we, this can all be put in a probabilistic framework and basically it amounts to alternating between two different steps. One is estimating a posterior over the rotation S and then, and then trying to infer the sparse code and then re-estimating the posterior, re-estimating the sparse code and iteratively going back and forth between these two to do the inference. And then just simply uh, to, to, to the learning of W and phi is done by gradient descent on the subjective function. Okay. Uh, so first of all, just, I'll just show you the results without the transformation. So if we simply take this, if we take this rotated MNIST data set and simply do uh, sparse coding on it, which is obviously the wrong thing, but, but that's, that's kind of the point here, right? If you just sort of say, well, gosh, what are the patterns in this world? Then this is what it learns, okay? It's sort of some weird blurred amalgam of maybe sort of digits and different uh, con configurations. And it can describe, it can, you know, it's going to sort of struggle to describe uh, these, each of these rotated digits in terms of these 10 different templates combined together, but it can kind of, it can kind of approximate them somewhat well. But you can see it's kind of a nonsensical co combination. It sort of takes this weird squiggly shape combined together with sort of a ghostly nine and ghostly zero and combines those and it says, okay, well, let's describe what's there. Okay, but it's not really a meaningful description of, of what's, of what's where, there in the world and it's not particularly making a good approximation um, either. It's missing a lot of information. But now what we're going to do here is simply augment this representation with one additional scalar variable. That's what's kind of remarkable about this. Okay, so we have 10 alphas here, one for each of these dictionary elements, phi, and we're going to add one more scalar to it, s, okay, but with the right mathematical structure from this, from this Lie algebra, and now we can actually learn the structure of in this world, okay, so now, now the dictionary converges upon these 10 different digits that are present in the scene, and W, interestingly, learns a rotational Fourier basis. Basically, it's what it's doing as a Fourier transform, the way, one way to think about this, these, these patterns. These are, each of these patterns is multiplied with the image through an inner product, right? You take the inner product of each one of these functions with the image, okay? Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's basically a Fourier transform in, in the, along the angular axis. And what this allows you to do is rotate basically through a phase shift in the Fourier domain, okay? So that, that's what's being done here. Okay, so once you do this, now you come up with a much more sensible way of describing uh, the, the, these digits. If I, if I show you, uh, uh, for example, this object here, then it says, okay, well, that's something I know about, I've seen before, that's this canonical object in this pose, rotated by that amount, okay? Uh, and, um, and, and, so, and, and so forth, and, and then, you know, this, this three, this rotated is, you know, says, okay, well, that's, a, that's, a, that's a three, something I've seen before, uh, rotated by a different amount, okay? And so now what's interesting about it is not only can it understand and, and, and come up with a more meaningful representation of its world in terms of a set of shapes and transformations acting upon them. So this is representing the posterior distribution over that angle. I'm sorry if you're not explaining that. This is the image, the reconstruction. This is the posterior over the transformation S, the single, uh, the, the basically the, the angle of rotation. And then this is just uh, which dic each dictionary element weighted by its value, inferred value L. Okay, so once you've done this learning, it's, it's learned basically the general idea of rotation. So potentially, uh, we could show, us, uh, show it a new object it's never seen before, and it would now understand what that new object would look like in all these different rotations. Okay, it would it be able to, to, to generalize to these different, to these different, um, uh, different, different points of view. Okay, so as I said, this is still early days, uh, but it's just meant as kind of a, a, a very simple example of the idea we're sort of thinking about the kind of computations that brains would have to do in order to reason, reason geometrically about the world. Um, and, and, and so I, you know, basically, uh, I hope I've told you something interesting about the world of jumping spiders that you can see a lot of this general, general purpose reasoning in, in animals uh, way back in the evolutionary chain, uh, back to insects and spiders. And this, is, this geometric reasoning is, very, is really necessary to allow them to, to survive in the environment, to navigate, to orient, to plan routes, to capture prey. And finally, I really think that um, this is what I, maybe the idea I want to leave you with is that I think that this idea of Lie algebras these, from the Lie group theory is really fundamental. It's, it's really the fundamental mathematical way to describe transformations. And so we should be thinking about how do neural circuits do this, right? How can you design circuits that implement these kinds of Lie group transformations? And this is just sort of a simple example uh, uh, along those lines. Okay, so that's... Uh, Basically, it for me. Well, thank you very much, Bruno, for the very inspiring talk, as usual. Um, so we have many questions already. Um, we can start with the first one. Um, 
by uh, Mufichu. I think you can talk now. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so first of all, thanks uh, for such an informative uh, talk. Uh, so you give an example of the information process by two years by delaying, uh, delaying the information. So I just wondering whether the information from the multiple modalities, say audio, visual modalities are, are processed in the similar way in the human brain, that means say audio or visual modality to capture uh, the geometric transformations uh, in the similar way or not? Um, okay, so I, I wasn't getting all of that, but it sounds like you're asking about are, the, are these sort of audio visual transformations captured in a similar way in the brain? Yeah. Yeah, that means uh, the two years, that is uh, in the slide, you mentioned that uh, they process, uh, the years process the information by delaying the information. Yes. Whether the multiple modality also process in a similar way in the human brain. Well, um, you know, it matters what part of the brain you, you, you go into. I mean, like there, there are certainly areas in the cortex that are doing this sort of multimodal fusion of um, auditory and visual information. Particular kinds of transformations, I think, that are being done are, are much, much more murky. But another place where you see this happening is in the superior colliculus or in the midbrain, uh, which is a sort of a, a subcortical structure where, they where the neurons form a, a spatial map from auditory information, and they also form a visual map uh, from coming from the retina. And one of the interesting things there that has to happen is another kind of coordinate transformation has to take place because when you move your eyes, now the image data is changing with respect to your head, right? And you're localizing the sound and space with respect to your head and forming an auditory map and head-centered coordinates. And, and in the retina, you have a map of what's out there in the world in, vision, in retinal coordinates. And now when you move your eyes, that changes, right? So there has to be some kind of correspondence made. And people have looked at that and you see something. It's kind of, you know, like a lot of things in biology, it's not, exact, it's not, not exactly what you would expect. It's sort of doing half of the transformation. It's sort of shifting a little bit in the direction you might expect. Whether that involves delay lines, I mean, it's a whole nother, whole nother matter. I mean, I think what a, one of the points I, I wanted to make here is that, uh, is that you, you, see, uh, you see basically the morphology of these neural circuits basically suggests to you a lot of what they're doing computationally. And so I would expect like, you know, in this, in this model of McCulloch and Pitts, uh, you know, in order to compute these visual transformations, well, the wires kind of have to go in a certain way to do that. And uh, my dream would be to find such things. <laughs> I think if you, if you could find such circuits, and my guess is, uh, you know, maybe something like that is there. People just haven't looked. Uh, that, but by, but, but the, only, the only way we're going to know what to look for is by fleshing out these theories, by developing more concrete theories of, of these group transformations, and how would that be done in the anatomy, and then we'd have something more, more concrete to look for. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, next, we have um, a question by Aaron. Uh, Aaron, would you like to speak it? <clears throat> okay, well, um, I've been wondering for a long time whether there's more going on in brains than the neural nets can support because of our abilities to discover impossibility, which is not uh, something that can be derived from statistics or its obvious necessary connections, as was done in ancient geometry, for instance, and topology. And I've just wondered whether the suggestion some neuroscientists are making, namely that a vast amount of subneural chemical activity is performing important reasoning computations, is something you've considered. And if you think it's wrong, perhaps you could tell us why. Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I think yeah, the computations are occurring at all levels, uh, you know, through uh, chemical and molecular gradients across membranes up until, you know, voltages propagating through neurons. So I think it's definitely at all levels. I thought the idea of impossibility you were asking about is like, how do, how do we recognize something as being impossible? Yeah, or we necessarily just, true. Or yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to use that as an excuse to, to get back to me, because I meant to mention that this, this is, uh, you know, the touch base back to what John yeah. Tenenbaum was talking about, these intuitive physics ideas, right? And so the, this ability to, to, to learn and understand things about transformations also lets us know kind of what is impossible, right, in a way. Like what would be highly implausible if an object sort of morphed and changed in a completely 
non-physical way, well, then we would be like, wow, that's bizarre, you know, but how do we know that? Well, because it doesn't fit our model um, of, of the transformations we've learned about things that don't. Um, um, and that doesn't fitting is, is something that can be represented as an impossibility, not just a low probability. Because yeah, that's an interesting question. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, yeah. Because I'm just sort of saying it'd be a little probability, but uh, yeah. Uh, um, okay, thanks. Uh, so we're, we're kind of running out of time, but maybe one more question from Utkarsh. Hi, thank you for the talk. It was, it was amazing. Um, I just had a couple of questions about the rotated MNIST uh, example. So the first question was, it, it seems that in the visualization, all the digits recovered were upright, or a majority of them were upright. Is that something that was like, recovered by the example? Oh, sorry, that was recovered by the model, or is it just uh, uh, the, the, you mean like the actual orientation of the learn? Yeah, that's sort of arbitrary. I don't know why. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if Ho Yin's on the line, <laughs> you can say, but there, the, the, actually I should say that for this particular example, the range of rotations was, was somewhat limited between minus 75 and plus 75 degrees. So Got there it. might be a bias here, but you're right. I mean, it's a little kind of suspicious they're all upright. They sh it should be sort of totally arbitrary what, you know, the, uh, the orientation of each of these learned templates. Makes sense. And yeah. a follow-up question was that in this case, we had to sort of hand code this uh, the matrix exponential for the rotation, right? Do you think there might be a more general approach that can sort of learn the lead, lead group as well? Well, okay, so like I'm using I'm using T uh, I'm using T here, but it's not time. <laughs> it's a, oh, okay, so so it's just a it's just a number, right? So, uh, but it can be time, and that's kind of interesting. It sort of begs, you know goes back to like how would you implement this? And it turns out, well, this is actually the solution to a first order differential equation of the form I dot equals a times I. Okay, so one possibility is that you can actually implement this uh, via a dynamical system uh, and uh, that would then propagate, take, take, take an object and propagate it across the map or propagate it in order to rotate it and so forth. And that's another, I think, interesting possibility uh, I'd like to explore. Great, thank you.